All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Charlie Morton, and I'm going to talk to you today about how to build your ice radius policy sets. And we're going to start talking about the policy break uh, basics. How do we break them down? Uh, make it a, a pretty simple flow for you guys, hopefully. So please just ask questions and, and keep up. Uh, we got a lot to get through today, so I'm just going to jump on into it. So over the past two webinars, we've used this slide pretty heavily. Um, but in this one, I'm going to be focusing on this portion of the slide, specifically the policies and the decisions made to allow or disallow access to the network. Uh, the way we build policies in ICE is take the information we know from the resources used on the network to make decisions to allow access in the first place. Then, with different levels of access based upon what the endpoint is, where they are authenticating, and what they are trying to access. This is our who, what, where, why model, and we'll even add in the when. If you remember this slide from last month's webinar, Secure Access, it tells a compelling story of the steps used to evaluate an ICE policy and to make a decision. You can follow along with the packet capture, the information is presented, and decisions are made. This goes from the access request to the final access accept or access reject decision. And let's break this down a little bit further. This one may be a little oversimplified, but it'll get the idea across. With each policy, there is a decision, and these decisions are yes, no decisions. The policy set screen itself is a policy and comes with its own decision. The main question being, can I get access? It comes down to whether you, as the endpoint or the user, matches a condition. If not, access is denied. If you do match the condition, you get the results to that decision and specific protocols will be used to allow you onto the network. If you don't use those protocols, you are denied access. If you do, you move on to the authentication policy and the decision process starts again. As you can see from this slide, there are far more reasons to deny access than there are to grant it. Building your policies with this in mind will ensure that you have the most secure access to your network. To simplify this even further, there are a series of if-then statements to allow or disallow access to your network. We're going to use these four building blocks to show how to build ICE policy for efficiency and ease. Since this webinar is all about radius policy sets, if we take a look at the menu in ICE, we can see that the policy sets are shown here under the policy menu. While we will be spending some time here, that's not where we spend most of our time. If you look at the policy element submenu, you'll see what we'll be doing. We need to build the if, and then we will build the then. But how do we build the conditions to make up the if? We use dictionaries to create or assign attributes that we will use to build our conditions. And we'll show you that later on in this session. So if you remember this slide, the conditions are always the if. The results, which are the allowed protocols, identity sources, and identity source sequences and authorization profiles, are always going to be the then. And this is going to be shown in our policy set. So if we take a look at our policy set screen, the if is the condition, and it's a condition in all policy decisions. These are the decisions to be made, and the then is the allowed protocols or radius service sequence. These are the results of the decision from the conditions. You can move on to the authentication decision if you meet these conditions and the protocol or external radius server shown in the results. This is a non-exhaustive list of the attributes that can be used to create a condition. I'll take you some through some of these throughout our time together today. So hold on tight. It's going to be a, a fun one. <laughs> I've broken down the conditions into the multiple parts because there's so much to get through when we're talking about the conditions and the decisions to be made in your policies. So moving on to the conditions for a policy set condition decision, you can see that I'm using the device location and device type to make this decision. These properties are created when you configure your network device groups. Once you add your network devices, you can set these properties for each device. They can then be leveraged as part of the decision making I'm using it at the highest level for the policy set decision. They can also be using any other decision using conditions. And how do we build these conditions for our policies? Well, ICE has built-in condition studio that is easy to use with loads of pre-built conditions. You can search for specific conditions 
using the list on the left, or you can create your own conditions in the editor window. One big thing to remember though, is the use button. You must click the use button to use that condition in your policy. If you click the save button, you can save your condition, but it will not inject that condition into your policy. So we're gonna take a look at that right now and do a quick demo of the condition studio. So if we come here into ICE, you see, if we go to our policy sets, wherever there is a decision to be made or you want to create a new policy set or any policy, if you click the plus here in your, uh, under your conditions, if you click this plus here, that's where you can add new conditions and it brings up this condition studio. And you can see here, we can search by name over here. So no matter what we want to do, if we're looking for 802.1x, we have some pre-built conditions over here. You can use this bar here to look for different, you know, location-based conditions, network device conditions. And you can just scroll through here and see the different types of conditions that we have built for these different specifications. So one of the great things about these conditions, if we're using, you know, one of these pre-built, library conditions we just drag it over here and it's already showing you what it is so the way that we did our device conditions is we actually did a custom condition where we come in here to click to add attribute change our dictionary to device then check device type and then we can choose the device types that we have set when we created our network device groups so for wired we would do switches wireless we do WLC, if we're doing like a VPN or whatever, we can choose ASA. You can also do the same thing by using the location instead of device type. You can choose from the locations that you have set. So, like you said, if you click save, you're going to get this dialog here saying, how do you want to save this? Do you want to save it as a an update to a, an existing condition or as a brand new condition? Well, I don't want to save it. I just want to use it in my policy. So I just click use here and you can see that it puts it right here into the policy set. All right. So I'm going to save this real quick and then get back into, yeah, I don't have an allowed policy, so I'm not going to save that. <laughs> and then get back here into our presentation. All right. So the results for the policy set are the allowed protocols or radius server sequence. We're going to focus on the allowed protocols in this webinar. So first thing you should know about the allowed protocols is you'd have a different allowed protocols for every method that you use to access the network. Wireless, wireless guest, wireless.1x, VPN, secure wired access, any way that you access the network differently should have a different allowed protocols. The default entries that are shown throughout ICE shouldn't be modified. Use them as guides. Select the default and then click the duplicate button. That way you always have the Cisco provided entries to use as a guide to look back on. If you open the default network access allowed protocols, you'll see that there are a lot of protocols shown. Um, the likelihood that you are allowing all of these protocols on your network is pretty low. So only allow the ones that you are. For less secure protocols like PAP ASCII, if you're certain you're using this protocol, create a different allowed protocols and policy set to separate this traffic from other traffic. Wireless mal authentications only need process host lookup to be enabled and nothing else. So that's your wireless guess. If you're using EAP in your allowed protocols, set a preferred EAP protocol and ISO will look for this method first. That's a lot of information. I get it. The all allowed protocols page is long. It doesn't mean it has to be daunting. Don't second guess yourself. You already have a good idea of the protocols that are being used on your network. So deselect those that you know you aren't using and the rest of, the rest of it should be pretty simple and fall in line. Remember wireless guest is a single checkbox. Process host lookup. That allows your Mac authentication bypass. Wireless.1x isn't much more complicated. Throw in secure wired access, which is basically allowing MAP along with the same protocols as your wireless dot one X, and you have a pretty robust deployment shaping up. 
Speaking of eat, these are the supported eat methods and how they are likely to be used on your network. ETLS is the protocol used for certificate based authentications and is supported by all major operating systems. TEEP is the open standard method for authenticating user and device in a single packet, which replaces eat fast. Just be mindful that leap and MD, EAP MD5 are legacy protocols and should be avoided if possible. Okay, so that the policy set policy. Now we're going to take a look at the authentication policy. And the same thing here. Under conditions, we have our if statement. If you meet this condition, then use this result. Having said that, we have conditions part two coming up here. When using conditions for the authentication policy, we've made it easy for you. As part of the effort to keep it simple, you can see that we have dictionary conditions for both .1x MAB, for both the .1x and the MAB authentication flows. Notice the default rule and there are no conditions. Do not use the default rule. This should be set to deny access. If the endpoint makes it to the default rule, then you have to recheck your previous rules to make sure they're written correctly because you don't want any endpoint or user to be falling down to the default rule. The conditions used in the authentication policy are authentication smart conditions and have been created by Cisco to be brand agnostic if using one of the network device profiles included with ICE. We'll take a look at these in a few minutes. So part of the results is we're going to be looking at the identity sources and identity source sequences and identity sources are the services against which your users or devices authenticate. You can have more than one identity source. You can have more than one of a single type of identity sources. So you can have multiple active directory domains, radius token servers based on geography, whatever, however you have it set up. When this happens, you need an identity source sequence. This tells ICE the order in which you want the identity sources processed. You can see here that I have Active Directory Domain Controllers listed in priority order based upon geographic regions. This way, local authentications are processed first and authentications from travelers are secondary. Part of building the identity source and identity source sequence is the certificate authentication profile. If you're using certificate-based auth authentications, then you want to use this because the purpose of the certificate authentication profile is to inform ICE which certificate field the identity can be found on the client certificate presented to ICE during certificate authentication. In the use identity from, you can choose from these seven different options to, to populate in and get the identity information from your certificate. If you use an Active Directory, you can just say, use any of those seven fields for identity information. You also have control over the behavior of the endpoint session if authentication fails, the user is not found, or if the process fails. If you expand the options menu under the identity store, you can see these. The options you can set are reject the session by using an access reject or drop the session, or continue to the authorization policy. If using external radio servers, the authentication will be performed by them and will skip the authentication policy in ICE as this will be an authorized only scenario. However, in guest access where MAB is the authentication flow, the MAC address will not exist in the internal endpoints database until the user clicks the submit button on your guest portal and the MAC address is then deposited into your, your internal endpoints database. In this case, you want to use the if user is not found and set that con to continue so that the endpoint will get the redirect to the guest portal and have the ability to register. All right, so now we're going to take a look at the authentication smart condition and the identity source sequences. So if we go back over here, like I said, we're going to be spending a lot of time on our policy elements and take a look at our conditions. And look at our smart conditions. These are the authentication smart conditions here. And you can see we have six different smart conditions built in here. And what I was saying about being brand agnostic is that these are built using the network device profiles that come with ICE. 
since this is wired 802.1x, it tells you that these device profiles are not used. So all the wireless profiles are not going to be used in, in your wired profile. Makes total sense. If you go to wireless.1x, you can see that we have a lot more device profiles shown here and the different attributes used for these authentication methods are going to change depending on which network device profile you're using. And if we go here into identity source sequences, which is actually over here under identity management, you can see that looking at the Active Directory identity source sequences that I mentioned in the presentation, I've got my Active Directory servers prioritized based on geographic region. And then if I want to use certificate-based authentication for those Active Directory servers, I just choose which certificate authentication profile I want to use for that, and I save. Then I can use this identity source sequence in my authentication profile or authentication policy. Sorry. So if we go back over here, go back to the Emir, my authentication policy shows my identity source sequence. All right. So Going back over to our presentation, we're going to take a look at the authorization policy now. Now, this is where all the magic happens and we get to say who has what access to what resources on the network. Of course, again, our conditions are the if and our authorization profile is result. We can use authorization profiles or security groups. We're going to focus on the authorization profiles here because security groups is going to be a much larger topic for a different webinar. All right, and of course, now we have to talk about conditions again. Here we have a dictionary condition that was added through the conditions studio. It's concise and the name conveys, the name conveys the conditions to be met for the desired results. If you're connecting through wired map, you move on to the results. However, when building our own conditions, they usually look more like this. You can read through that list of conditions and come away with the intent, or depending on how it's written, you can look at it and get confused. In the condition studio, you can build complex conditions and save them. This is called a compound condition, and they can be named to convey the intent of the condition. But not only does this make reading policies more efficient, but also helps ease the burden of troubleshooting. Therefore, they're fine thereby decreasing man hours spent on a specific issue. For this one, it's best to just go ahead and jump right in to the conditions. So we're going to do that. Um, for our authorization policy, we're just going to look at throw in a new one and looking at a compound condition. So let's let's try our employee access that I showed you before. And we're going to take this over here. This is our compound condition that I've created before this. <clears throat> now, I know what this says, and I showed you what it said on the slide, but if you want to go back and recheck this or to update it at any time, then all you have to do is you click edit, and this breaks it out into the different policies or conditions that make up your compound condition. So you can go in here, change whatever you need to change in here or add to it. Click the new to add to it. And this gives you your opportunity to change your attribute here. Um, if you wanted to add your Active Directory uh, common name for your certificate field equals, then you can add a specific value here. And then you can save this. At this point, it's going to pre-populate it since it's already a compound condition. It'll pre-populate it. So we'll just update that library condition, or you can save it as a new library condition with the CN name.
of employee. And it does not like my equal sign. So there's always a good reminder of special characters that you can and cannot use. So now that we have that, if we look at employee, we have our CN equals employee over here. Drag that over. Oh, we already had it. So let's get rid of one. Condition Studio is actually pretty easy to use as far as that goes. Just click the X in the corner of the compound condition, dictionary condition, or single condition that you're using to get rid of it. Click edit again, it expands it, and we can just check to make sure that our common name employee is being shown. All right, so we're gonna close this without using and say, yep, I don't want to, to save it. And go back to our screen and get back into presentation. All right, <clears throat> the results of the authorization policy is the authorization profile, and that's what we're going to focus on. But let's talk about some of the other things that we can do other than just issuing an access accept or access reject. I mean, at its core, ICE is a radius server, and access is granted or denied by the access accept or access reject. But if you ask anyone, they'll tell you that ICE is much more than a radius server, which it is. But let's not lose focus of the core functions. When access accept attribute is passed to grant access to the network, ICE can also assign a VLAN to that specific radius session port or domain, creating a logical segmentation of users, devices, and resources. To take it a step further, ICE can also assign ACLs, whether they are downloadable ACLs using existing ACL network devices. The great thing about leveraging existing ACLs is that ICE can use named ACLs or ACL group names. So if you have ACLs in use across data centers or regions and the ACLs have different number assignments, you can name them and simplify not only the radius policies used, but also your infrastructure deployment. Lastly, again, we talked about it. ICE can assign scalable group tags known as SGTs to assign group-based policy as a result of the authorization rule. But again, that's a topic for another webinar. In the authorization profile, there are three areas. The main profile area, the common tasks area, and the advanced attributes settings. Let's start in the main area. You should give this a concise logical name that easily conveys the intent of the permission contained. A description is always recommended, but it's more necessary when the permissions that are contained cannot be fully conveyed throughout the name. This access type is where you set the very basic of radius session attributes, access accept or access reject. Then you can select the network device profile to be applied to this authorization profile. Then we move down to these check boxes. The first one can be enabled for session aware network devices, and this will mark the authorization profile with a flag that makes it service template compatible. Since the service template is also, is also an authorization policy, this makes the authorization rule a single rule that can be compatible with both SANet and non-SANet devices. Next, we have a box that enables location-based authorization results. Historically, this was done using the Mobility Services Engine, but that has been retired, and now we look for this to enable the PX Grid Cloud integration of DNA spaces. This is and always has been recommended only for high security locations. The third, belt, the third box is self-explanatory and it enables an agentless posture. And then finally, we have the enable that we have the option to enable the easy connect flow for policy enforcement and user tracking. This is a look at all the high level options available for the common tasks section of the authorization profile. I've enabled some options just to illustrate the options that will show for those items once the parent is enabled. For our example here, we will be using the DACL name, the VLAN, and the Airspace ACL name. You need the Airspace ACL name to reference the ACL on a Cisco wireless controller. A few things to note, we will configure the downloadable ACL here on ICE. 
VLANs can be referenced using the ID name or group name. And the airspace ACL is a preform text block. I usually copy and paste the ACL name from the wireless controller just to make sure there are no leading trailing, no leading or trailing spaces, and that I have all the upper and lower case characters set correctly. Advanced attributes uses the settings found in the ICE dictionaries. And we'll talk more about these in a bit when we start talking about the advanced attributes. But if it's not located in your common task section, section you can usually define it using an advanced attribute. You can add more than one advanced attribute by using the plus and minus icons here to add or subtract different attributes from your authorization profile. Now that we've taken a look at the configurable sections of the authorization profile, the attributes details shows the radius attributes that we've passed as results of the authorization profile. You'll notice that access accept or access reject will always be first, followed by the values set in the common task pane. Uh, for the attributes that you don't know or recognize, honestly, a quick Google search for radius tunnel type 13 will tell you exactly what that means. It means that Radius tunnel type is a VLAN. So if you don't know what these attributes are, it's a quick search to find it out. Then in my advanced attributes, I set the VPN tunneling protocol to IPsec, which corresponds to four here. And then we're gonna talk about the downloadable ACLs. I told you that we're using that in our authorization profile. We have to create one to be able to be used. Now, the great thing about it is it's written just as any other ACL, but can be tagged as either IP4 or IPv6 agnostic so that you can use the same downloadable ACL throughout your deployment. There's even a syntax checker for the ACL to ensure that it's valid. So if you're using any arguments that it does not like, it'll tell you which row and what syntax you're using it doesn't like. Okay, so now the authorization profiles demo. Go back over here to your policy elements. Since authorization profiles is one of our then statements, it's a result. So go to the result and authorization. Now authorization profiles is listed, it shows downloadable ACLs. I usually make my downloadable ACLs first because if I'm gonna Reference those in my authorization profile, might as, know, might as well know what I'm referencing. So back to our employee access that we've been looking at so far today. And you can see here that not only do you have the same options as your ACLs, you can add different trails on here for like logging. And then if we check, it says that the ACL is valid. And if we go in here and just put in some gibberish and check our ACL again, it's going to tell you, hey, there's gibberish. Um, the legal options for that to append to our ACL line here are going to be these different options. It has to be put in this type of format for us to be able to use it. So syntax checker is pretty good when you're doing some complex and long ACLs so that you know that is going to work when you pass it on to your network devices. Okay, so now moving into our authorization profile, we're gonna look for our employee access again. All right, so I have passive identity tracking here, which means I can use Easy Connect in my environment. Uh, my downloadable ACL name, like I said, this takes all of your downloadable ACLs that you've built and puts them into a drop down box so you can choose whichever one that you want to use here. Uh, if you're using an ACL that's already on your network device, you don't have anything here, so you can just type in what the ACL name is on your network device. We're not using that, so we're not going to. Your VLAN, 
Um, although it does have a drop down here, we don't have anything populated. You just put in whatever VLAN that you have here, whether it's VLAN ID, VLAN name, or VLAN group name. All of those are viable to use here. Um, web reader direction that will become uh, covered in our guest access. You got your re-authentication timer that you can set here. MaxSec policy if you want to do MaxSec. And your airspace ACL name. This is for our wireless. And that would not work because I have the equal sign here. But again, it's free flow text. You put in the exact name of your ACL that is on your wireless LAN controller. If you're using IPv6, then you want to do the same thing here for your IPv6 ACLs. The advanced attributes. These come from the dictionaries that we use within ICE. And that's what I showed you at the beginning using that menu about the building blocks for our conditions. So whatever we have here, we can use. Um, if we're using a VPN, then we're going to use a VPN 3000, even though it's not a VPN 3000 because the VPN concentrators are long gone. This is what we use for the VPN tunnels. These are radius attributes that are going to pass along to be able to use it. As you can see here, the attributes change to ASA or PIX or whatever it is for us to be able to reference whatever we're doing with the VPN. Um, So we take a look at that and we pass the attribute that we're going to want. A lot of these can also be free form text. Um, and then we come down here. These, this is the attributes details that I showed you that is going to show you exactly what's going to be passed on to our network devices. All right, so back over, and we're going to talk about conditions yet again, just because it's such a huge part of ICE. So other policy conditions that we have are kind of intermediate level conditions, and we're going to take a look at the time and date conditions that can be used. Now, as you can see from this screen, it's a pretty powerful tool that can be used to set this condition. You can grant access all day, every day, forever, or any combination of that contained. If you want to limit access, use the exceptions. You leave the standard settings as shown, but turn off access for certain days or times. Working for higher ed and you want to allow guest access in the football stadium only on game days, well, here you go. You would allow from 4 to 11 p.m. on Fridays or you always want to allow guest access except during proctored exams. Cool, you always allow it except for from 2 to 6 p.m. on May 5th because we have an exam coming up that day. You know, stuff like that. It's a pretty powerful tool that you can use to limit different ways that you can allow or disallow access. Now we're gonna talk about dictionaries real quick and these, like I said, are the building blocks for decisions and conditions to be made in. You probably thought that we'd be talking about that much sooner than now, but the truth is many ice deployments run perfectly fine without ever visiting this page or changing or adding to anything in the conditions or dictionaries. When employment does need to add to this page, it's usually to add radius dictionaries for vendors that are not currently in ice. And let's face it, we, just, we can't add them all. So as my gift to you, I'm going to give you a great resources compiled a lot of vendor specific attributes, which are those radius conditions for those vendors. And they're ready to be downloaded and installed into ICE. Um, don't install more than you need. And I say that because there are a lot of vendors on this list and 
having ICE run through that whole list just to figure out which VSAs you need can can impact performance. So we're going to take a look at that real quick and look at the radius dictionaries. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to that link that I just sent you. That's this right here. And I'm going to choose a vendor pretty much randomly. Um, Manzara. Why not? Let's do Manzara. Uh, where do I want to put this? How do I, there it is. There's tools. All right. So I'm going to put this in tools. Dictionary Manzara. Save that. Come back over to ICE. Now, I can click dictionaries here. Of course, this is shown under policy, policy elements dictionaries. That's the same page. Then we want the, the system dictionary. This is where our radius is set. So we're going to go down here to our radius and expand that and radius vendors. These are the built-in radius vendors from ICE, except for APC. I, I added that one. If we want to add another one, we just click, you know, you can click add and you can type in it all, type it all in. If you know all the different um, attributes that you want to put in here, then you can do it that way. But with that list, we don't have to, we can just click import and tell it what file that we want to import. In tools. And you know what? Look at me not being smart enough to name it correctly, right? There it is, Dictionary Manzara. And then once we import that, it says it could take a few minutes for the file to be imported. It's not going to take a few minutes. It, it'll be pretty quick. See, it's already imported here. Let's get rid of this. You see Manzara is being shown here. However, if you expand, your radius vendors, Manzara, it's also shown here. So whether you click here or through the menu here, you can come to the Manzara and then click in your dictionary attributes. And these are the different attributes that can be used in your radius policies for that vendor. All right. Some of the cool things, though, that you can take a look at inside your dictionaries is some of the stuff that we've already used, like our device. If we go to device and then device type, you can see all of our device types that we've created in our network device groups are listed here. Then same thing for location. All of the locations that we've set in our device and our vice groups are shown here in the location. So all of the attributes that we create throughout ICE, most of them are actually set here inside your dictionaries so that we can use them in conditions. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out though is that for your date and time conditions that we had just set for our football stadium or for test taking, um, those are different. They don't go into a dictionary right away. They actually create their own dictionary condition over here. So if you see exam no guest, we've got that here. That We can just drag that over. And the same thing with the football guest date. So just drag it over and use that within our conditions. So if we say exam guest date time, come back in over here real quick. I wanna actually show you something that I would use that for, and that's gonna be in there, guest sponsored portal. So if you want to have that guest network show up only during the football games, then you would drag this over here and use it here. 
And then you do the same thing for your redirect. Football guest date and time and use. All right, and what that does is if you're using wireless map and it's between, what would we say, four and 11 on Friday nights, then you're gonna get the sponsored redirect. And same thing, if you've already registered and you're trying to connect um, in your identity group, your MAC address is already in the guest endpoint, endpoint identity group, and it's between four and 11 on Friday night, then you'll have access to that guest network as well. And you can do the same thing with the exam, whatever, just so it falls within that date and time or the exceptions date and time, then you're gonna have that level of access that's granted. The other thing that I did bring up that I wanted to show you guys, cause it's something that I think is pretty important is your authentication policy and how I said, don't use the authentic the default authentication policy. And the reason for that is if you use your reports or an external login server and you're trying to sort upon, I want to see how many people are authenticating and you know, what's my most highly used authentication type and everything comes back as default. You're still not going to know anything as far as what your authentications are. You're going to have to dig deeper into that result to see if it's a uh, wireless map, wireless.1x, wired.1x or whatever, instead of just being able to see just by looking at your authentication rule name. So sponsored map, you already know that that's your sponsored guest portal using map. So that makes that a lot easier. A uh, quicker way to show you kind of what I mean by that is if you go to administration system settings and then you decide, oh no, that's not what I wanted. Um, Identity management settings. No, wait, no, that's not it. Uh, work center settings. N no, I want to, I'm sure it's device portal management settings. Oh, no, it was one I've already gone to, but over here, it just says settings. So it doesn't tell me which settings it is. I don't know what it is until I click on it. That's going to be pretty much the same thing if you're using default in your authentication rules. It's just going to be a word that doesn't mean anything to you until you click on it to figure out what it actually means. All right, so now we're going to hit back to our uh, presentation. Now, in building your policy sets, we have some maximums. You can have a maximum of 200 policy sets. I mean, it's you can build this out pretty large, a thousand authentication rules. That's huge. Authorization rules at 3000. Um, I've not seen a, a deployment that had half of these numbers. So these are pretty big numbers. And I think that they can service most anything that's out there. Uh, one of the other things about your policies is that you can have three different states for these policies. You can have them enabled, which means that it's working like you want it to work. You can disable the rule. Uh, you saw that I had one of my rules disabled in my policy sets. And then you have monitor. So what this means is when you're building a policy in a production environment, you build it in a disabled state. That way you can you know, save it and you don't lose any of your work, but it's not affecting anything that you're doing on your network. It won't say it won't affect any of your client or user authentications or authorizations. Um, once you're happy with how the conditions and results are built, put it into the monitor state. This will show you the hit counts and live logs as though you were as though it were enabled, but it won't actually affect that radius session. It's great for troubleshooting also. When a rule is finally acting as you want it to act, you just set it as enabled and it'll work the way that you had planned for it to work. You can do this for policy set rules, authentication rules, and authorization rules. All right, so for our policy optimization, one of the quick wins here is, now that I've actually mentioned them in my last slide, is the hit counters. Every radius policy in ICE has a hit counter, whether it's your policy set, your authentication, your authorization policy, all of that. 
This is another troubleshooting tool as well as a visual aid to show you whether your policies are working as intended. Uh, if you have a policy that is getting zero hits, then is it in the right order of your policies? We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, or is it just a policy that you don't need? If it's a policy you don't need, then it's processes and cycles that ICE does not need to go through to get your clients onto the network. So get rid of it, disable it or get rid of it. Um, having too many disabled policies, again, you don't want a ton of disabled policies unless you're actively working on creating new policies. Once everything is as it should be and you're out in production, you don't want a lot of disabled policies. Conditions again. Yep. I told you conditions is a big topic, so we're going to keep on talking about it. Um, here's an authorization rule that was put together and I got to say, it's kind of hard to tell what the intent is behind the rule. A user can go through the whole rule to be rejected at the end because they aren't in San Jose. If you take a look at this, you want to have your active director group equal all employees except for contractors. You can be in the registered devices endpoint identity group. You can be registered with MDM. You can match all of this criteria, but then, oh, you're not in San Jose, so you don't match this. You have to go to a different rule to get a different result. That's inefficient. It means that ICE has to process all of this before it gets to the reject and move on to another rule. Um, so what we're going to do is going to play a little quick game here. Or just do it in your mind. Um, and what we want to do is figure out which shape matches the conditions. Which one has 10 stars? You're all counting the stars right now. Good, good, good. I like that. But how many of them are green? I just want the green stars right now. Are there four? What about red stars? Okay, so which is in a red triangle? And this tells you right away that if I'd started with the red triangle, then you would have been able to pick the correct result from the beginning. So that's the kind of point that I want to make here is that start with the most obvious answer first and then build from there all the way down to the most specific. And that's what we've done here. Start with San Jose, start with the authentication method, start with the endpoint profile, and then go all the way down to the most specific, which would be the MTM, MDM registration status. So now we're kicking out everyone who's not San Jose to begin with and moving down in a more efficient and streamlined manner. You can also look at these as different blocks and you can see that those blocks are separated by either and or or conditions. You can also have and and or conditions as you can see here in between block three and block four, we have and and or. So you don't have to match every single rule. You can have a choice of those four different rules at the bottom, whereas in the previous slide, the ors were all over the place and harder to decipher. All right, so to that, let's just say ICE policies are constructed from a top-down approach. It means ICE processes the policies from the top as soon as it makes a decision or as soon as it finds a decision that meets all the criteria, it uses that policy and it does not process any further. In this example, the CXO, whether it's a CIO, COO, or CTO, has the highest level of access and therefore uses the most, stri most specific policy. The policy at the bottom is the least specific. So to put it another way, the groups with the most conditions tend to have the least amount of members. Does that make sense? So if you're building out more and more conditions, then th that group has less and less members to it. So you want those rules at the top of your policy so that it can just meet that criteria, 
pass on that access and move on to the next. And if we took out or if we moved the CXO down to the bottom, then if you look at these rules here, it would actually meet or yeah, it would meet the conditions and the criteria for IT staff. So it would hit IT staff. He wouldn't get his uh, leadership or ELT group permissions. It would also hit uh, domain users because everyone's a domain user that's part of the domain, right? So ordering of the groups is very important and probably the most overlooked um, optimization step that can be taken for ICE policies. I have a list of resources here that we'd love to give out. Uh, the webinars, of course, you guys use that to to register for this one, but we also posted all these videos to the ICE YouTube channel here. So about a week from now, you'll see that on the ICE YouTube channel. 